Hi everybody, welcome to this episode of Enlightenment Today. I'm Jason. In this episode, I'm going to speak about being in a state of flow and its original ancestor known in Chinese as Wu Wei from ancient China, which is a concept at the heart of Taoism and martial arts. Most of us are familiar with the term flow, but not so much with Wu Wei. But as I mentioned, flow is a much older concept going back to the Warring States period of ancient China, which I will discuss shortly. The term flow was first coined and popularized by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who is a Hungarian psychologist. He wrote a fascinating book called Flow back in 1990. When we think of flow, we think of an athlete, musician, writer, craftsman, or any artist when they appear to have, a, have this laser-like focus and precision, which is equated with them being in the zone. But our understanding of flow and how to induce it is at a very novice level. You can tell this by how the word is loosely thrown around in popular culture. You hear pe people say all the time that they're in the zone, man, or more to the point, I'm in the zone or I'm in the flow, which actually implies you're not in any state of flow if you have time to speak about it. We often hear athletes state after a great performance that they felt they were in a state of flow where all the other noise of the world was crowded out. They had tunnel vision. We all know that to be highly effective at our chosen skill, we need to enter a, a flow state of consciousness. But the problem for most of us is that we have no idea how to get in a flow state. Most of us incorrectly believe that this dimension of effortless skill and peak performance is a state of mind isolated to world-class performers. You need to eliminate this way of thinking and really absorb the information I am about to give to you. So you could say in this episode, I am going to give you the inside dope, how to understand and achieve a flow state. First and foremost, cultivating skill reach and reaching peak performance, in other words, entering a flow state, really depends on how we understand the mind and body. This is not some new radical way of thinking. This was actually the primary focus of numerous great thinkers throughout history. It, it doesn't matter whether East or West, understanding human thought and the mind's function has been a central focus for, for as long as we can remember. We've always been fascinated with why cultures and traditions developed, why certain religions were born to bind community, and why someone is more skillful at a particular craft than someone else. The process of thinking and how and why we think is at the foundation of philosophy, science, religion, and art. Both in the East and West, there has been numerous systems for understanding the mind for thousands of years. Some have stuck and many have disappeared. But for as long as we can remember, there has been a persistent myth pervading human civilization. That myth is mind-body dualism. This dualistic model of mind and body has become the standard template for which we study the mind and the body. And the result of this myth is that it is common for us to feel this split within us, which is evident in our language and actions. This dualistic model of mind and body is the big reason we don't understand what flow is. We tend to feel we are these rational minds in these completely irrational bodies. This mind-body dualism is the disembodied myth embedded in our modern thinking. This myth has led us to focus and believe firmly in an abstract reality where reason trumps all. So we end up believing we are these disembodied rational agents imprisoned within this meat suit we call a body. This disembodied myth is a philosophical hangover from Plato down to influential philosophers such as Descartes and Immanuel Kant. Philosophers such as these three propelled the dualistic model of mind and body along based on vague intuitions they had about a distinction between people who have minds and the physical world, which apparently doesn't have a mind according to them. Their metaphysics led to a dualism between a disembodied mind and a physical world of things. In post-enlightenment Europe and its colonies, rational thought was portrayed as the essence of human nature. 
reason became something completely disconnected from the physical world around us. Our mind and its rationality is thought to be superior and distinct to the body and its emotions. This disembodied myth has implanted a split within us that confuses us to no end. We have brought into the disembodied model of mind without questioning its validity. Science also has suffered from the disembodied model. Cognitive scientists in the mid 20th century treated the human mind as a brain in a container. Many experiments were concerned with abstract information processing, which led them nowhere. It wasn't until the past few decades that cognitive science began to change its perspective. Cognitive science is slowly moving away from the disembodied dualistic model and instead is beginning to treat human thought as fundamentally embodied. Cognitive science has shown through extensive research on embodied cognition that we are not the paragons of reason we assume to be. Though science is only just catching up to this perspective, many sages, artists, philosophers and even athletes have questioned the overuse of rationality because the actuality of their experience tells a whole other story. This also might be why artists, writers and philosophers are usually considered as having eccentric behavior by the general public. Many sages from the East, on the other hand, are often suspicious of rational people because rational people often think too much about everything. An artist would say being overly rational destroys beauty and truth. Just ask yourself, what is rational about a lot of art? Or even for the beauty in sport for that matter. Beauty is intrinsically in the performance. It is not something you have to think about, but instead it is something you appreciate and are inspired by. And yet, though the embodied state of mind may be the normal perspective for sages, artists, philosophers, and athletes, cognitive science has developed a sophisticated model for understanding the mind-body integrated system. This model is known as dual process theory and it is based on two systems of cognitive function. Psychologists like to create unique terms which define them as different from the rest of the scientific community. So these two systems are known as hot cognition or system one and cold cognition or system two. The hot system is the cognitive function that is automatic, spontaneous, fast, effortless, mostly unconscious and what is the primary driver of emotions. It is located in the more unconscious regions of the brain. Hot cognition operates automatically and is fast and spontaneous with little or no effort required. In the hot cognitive process, there is no sense of voluntary control. Cold cognition, on the other hand, is the cognitive control centers within our brain located in the prefrontal cortex. The cold system is self-conscious, slow, deliberate, effortful, and it is the part of the mind we refer to as ourselves, the I. So cold cognition is associated with the subjective experience of agency, choice, and concentration. In our growing world of rationality, we have overcompensated for the cold system, and we don't realize that both systems have their benefits and flaws. We need to understand that even though we feel as though we are these subjective agents who have conscious control, Hot cognition is still driving us mainly. So when we speak of expert skill, it is ultimately the result of the hot system. The time and practice spent on a particular craft cultivates ingrained skill. From the NRL legend Jonathan Thurston's ability to kick a winning goal in the dying moments of a game to the NFL quarterback Tom Brady's ability to throw a touchdown pass under pressure onto the ability of someone like Ida Heindel to play, the to play the violin, all of their skill is as ingrained a process as opening and closing our hand. Well, for those three individuals anyway. This is expertise. This is where the skill has become embodied and the cold function of thinking and analyzing has temporarily shut, temporarily shut down. Spontaneity takes over and as spectators we can pre appreciate the natural beauty of their skill. Not only does hot cognition bring the spontaneity of our natural movements to life, but it also brings the peak states of skill to the forefront of humanity, making our world much more beautiful than if 
we had to think and analyze everything we do as something that should be rational. Both systems are required to function optimally to develop skill. In music, you need to learn music theory over and over again to the point it is like reading your mother language. On top of this, you need to learn how to manipulate the body to make the noise coming out of the instrument to sound like a melody rather than a dying cat. For violin, you need to train your body to hold certain finger positions and also how to hold the bow. For drums, you need to learn how to hold the sticks and how to hit the drums while your feet simultaneously press down on the pedals with a beater attached to the hit, to hit the bass drum or kick drum, in other words. Like most things, learning any musical instrument takes time, but after a while, the skill becomes embodied. The musical instrument ends up being an extension of your body, like a fifth limb, because it becomes as easy and unconscious as walking. It is the constant focus and repetition exercised by a strong cold cognition that ingrains any particular skill into our hot system. To explain a strong cold cognition, it can focus on a task for a good length of time while a weak or lazy cold cognition is prone to answer questions with the first thing that comes to their mind, which leads to intuitive errors. Also, other characteristics of a weak cold system is impulsivity, impatience, and a desire for immediate gratification. But coming back to ingrained skill, once we download the cold cognitive physical application and theory of a particular skill into our hot system, the skill becomes spontaneous and can be accessed without having to consciously think about it. This process is constant in cultivating skill. Psychologist Daniel Kahneman explains this cognitive phenomenon by stating that as you become skilled in a task, its demand for energy diminishes. Studies of the brain have shown that the pattern of activity associated with an action changes as skill increases with fewer brain regions involved. Those of you seriously dedicated to a craft will continue to develop skill. This process teaches us to disengage from our cold cognition as well. And this is really important to understand. Even though world-class performers use cold cognition to learn a certain skill, once it has become embodied, cold cognition is like kryptonite to the effortlessness of the hot system. For example, a musician will perform without the sense of them doing it. What I mean is, when they start to think about what they are doing, you mess everything up. We, as the cold cognitive conscious self, are in our own way. When we are out of our own way, meaning our cold cognition has down-regulated, we are in the zone. Keep in mind, down-regulate is a word for decrease, diminish, or turning the volume down. So the dizzying height of skill is to be able to remain in this state of zone for longer periods of time. Our cold cognitive concentration gives way to a much deeper level of focus. If you are focused and not thinking, your cold cognition will slowly downregulate and you will be in the zone, in a state of flow. The effortless cognitive ease we feel when we are in the flow is when the lights are on but nobody is home, meaning the slow, cold thinking function that we mistaken for who we are has shut down. As a result, the ascetic beauty of the natural world comes alive through your skill. Understanding this modern science of flow demonstrates how human cognition is embodied. So the methods for cultivating skill should be approached with the new embodied model of the self, rather than the hangover of an old and dusty disembodied model of the self. And yet, though the embodied mind may appear new to cognitive science, it is only catching up to an embodied mo model of mind which is much more ancient. To sufficiently understand how to experience flow, we need to understand the wisdom and science behind the development of skill first explored in the East. The embodied model of the self was the primary viewpoint during the Warring States period of China and also other parts of Asia. But it was in China especially that we discover the embodied mind model. 
During the Warring States period, there were numerous philosophers and sages whose names we still know today, most notably Lao Tzu, Confucius, Mencius, and Zhuangzi. Though their philosophies may somewhat differ, their way for understanding the mind and body was the same. Their view of human nature was mind-body holism. Their philosophies, social systems, religions, and ritual practices reflect this holistic view. From centuries of ancient Chinese people following their philosophies and rigorous training to cultivate harmonious dispositions in the self, there is no doubt according to them that human cognition is embodied. Any other model, such as mind-body dualism, was shown the contempt it deserved. If in ancient China the embodied model of the self was understood to be how humans are hardwired, then we can see why a healthy skepticism developed towards mind-body dualism and its rational agents. In the East, in general, this skepticism shown towards rationality is culturally held firm. The battle within us, then, is not between a rational being attempting to lord it over an unruly body, but instead it is a tug of war between an allocation of function between two systems of hot and cold cognition. In the West and modern developed world, majority of our energy is allocated towards the function of the cold system trying to control the natural hot system. But in the ancient East, it is absurd to try and overemploy the cold system, especially when you consider the main driving force within us and our essential nature is within the hot system. The focus then in ancient China was more about ingrained skill and shaping our character because they can both be cultivated in our hot system as natural and spontaneous. Eastern thought then, especially the ancient Chinese embodied model of the self, is an essential corrective to the way modern Western philosophy has a tendency to focus on the cold cognitive aspects of conscious thought, rationality, and willpower. As a result, the modern revolution of embodied cognition and cognitive science was inspired partially by Eastern thought, especially ancient Chinese thought. The main focus of many ancient Chinese sages and philosophers during the Warring States period was the concept Wu Wei. Wu Wei literally means non-doing, non-force, and effortless action. The effortlessness of Wu Wei is ultimately a state of intelligent spontaneity. And I believe intelligent spontaneity is a more accurate term than flow when we are talking about that effortless state of mind. Keep in mind though that the concept of how Wu Wei is achieved differed slightly among each philosopher and sage. Zhuangzi's focus was on effortless skill or effortless action, which actually adapts perfectly to modern cognitive science. We can understand the effortlessness of Wu Wei when we think of those times we try too hard to achieve something. When we are often trying too hard, we are not allowing our for life to naturally happen. For example, when we put a key in a lock and we try to turn the key too fast, we feel resistance. To open the door, you need to be loose and relaxed. And then, and when you jiggle the key ever so softly, the door opens effortlessly. So by not forcing, you effortlessly moved through the task of opening the door. The key and door analogy is not only about how expert skill is effortless, but it is also a metaphor for how we move skillfully through life. No other sage or philosopher during the Warring States period explores skill more than Zhuangzi. The Zhuangzi text is like a manual for cultivating skill and training spontaneity, upon a lot of other things really. And this is why Zhuangzi synthesizes well with modern cognitive science. The skill emphasized by Zhuangzi in the Zhuangzi text is not only about expertise, but also life skills which are supposed to contribute to developing harmonious dispositions in the self. Zhuangzi, on a subtle level, examines the science of skill and how to reach peak performance to the point of explaining what the actual experience is like. Zhuangzi understood that spontaneous skill comes from the deeper, more evolutionary, ancient hot system. 
Somehow, we need to ignite the spontaneity within the hot system naturally. The cold system interferes with the spontaneity of life. Even in ancient China, people overly identified with the cold system, which gives one this sense of being an isolated self. Zhuangzi explains that our real nature, the authentic self, is beneath the rational cold cognition. He articulates this through skill stories that exhibit this transfer of functional allocation from the cold system back to the hot system. He uses the craftsman as an example to explain how skill and virtues can become so much a part of us that they are in instinctive and spontaneous. They are hot. One of the most famous stories in the Zhuangzi text is about a butcher called Kuk Ding or Butcher Ding. The Kuk Ding story setting is a traditional religious ceremony where an ox will be sacrificed in public for the ruler Lord Wen Wei and a large crowd of onlookers. Kuk Ding is the center of attention for this religious event. This ritual of animal sacrifice demands the difficult skill of using a blade with precise timing and perfect execution. But this is not so difficult for Kuk Ding. He slices and dices the, the ox up so effortlessly that Lord Wen Wei is astonished. Lord Wen Wei cannot believe such a mundane skill can reach the heights of beauty similar to an artistic performance. He approaches Kuk Ding to ask how he can cut an ox up so effortlessly. Kuk Ding explains that after years of cultivating skill, he now encounters the ox with his spirit and it spontaneously guides him in the right direction. Kuk Ding says, what I care about is the way, the Tao, which goes beyond skill. When I first began cutting up oxen, all I could see was the ox itself. After three years, I no longer saw the whole ox. And now, now I go at it by spirit and don't look with my eyes. Perception and understanding have come to a stop and spirit moves where it wants. I go along with the natural makeup, strike the big hallows, guide the knife through the big openings and follow things as they are. So I never touch the smallest ligament or tendon, much less a joint. So Cook Ding's ability to allow spirit to move where it wants from a contemporary perspective is the spontaneity of the hot system naturally functioning without the hindrance of cold cognitive analysis. When Cook Ding says perception and understanding have come to a stop and spirit moves where it wants, what he is really saying is when I have stopped the cold cognitive thinking apparatus, the spontaneous nature of the hot system takes over and moves effortlessly with the environment. And yet this ability of Cook Ding's expert butchery was something that took three years to master. From years of repetition and discipline, the skill of butchery was as effortless, instinctual and spontaneous as walking. The need to think about what he was doing evaporated. All that is left is a movement of effortlessness which feels no resistance in mind, body or environment. Cook Ding and his skill as a butcher are one because the skill is so ingrained in the hot cognition that it is as effortless as walking for him. His embodied mind has reached the height of skill, which is a state of intelligent spontaneity. Intelligent spontaneity is a common experience for the skillful craftsman. The story of Cook Ding is about how we effectively move through the world with skill and not feel resistance. Reaching your optimal potential is also the same, meaning you attain expert skill and your desired craft and that extends out into life in general. This feeling of effortlessness or flow and way is a state of psychological ease we feel through our whole body. The goal of Wu Wei then is to effectively move smoothly through all aspects of your life, where even unexpected events in your life are dealt with spontaneously with intelligence. No obstacle is too big or even really perceived as an obstacle anymore. In a state of Wu Wei, you don't press up against obstacles but instead you act in the same fashion as the gentle key trying to open the door, which means you may absorb the pressure of an obstacle, 
but because you don't resist it, you overcome it without forcing the outcome. This absorb and action technique is one of the foundational pillars of traditional martial arts. Modern martial artists, especially mixed martial artists, often use the word flow. It is used when someone appears to be very lucid and in the zone. Yet, as I mentioned, common understandings of the concept of flow are at a novice level, and this goes for a lot of martial artists. The spontaneous nature expressed through us in a state of Wu Wei is the deeper and more powerful raw material of our hot cognition functioning optimally. When there is no interference from the over analytical cold system, you express the spontaneity of human nature intelligently. Intelligent spontaneity then is a fully embodied state of mind where one is perfectly calibrated to the environment. The environment essentially becomes an extension of your skill. For example, when you are in a state of intelligent spontaneity in martial arts, you are perfectly calibrated to the obstacles you face with an opponent. The opponent will try everything to land a blow, but you see it almost in slow motion. As a result, you act spontaneously without it feeling like a reaction because there was no conscious thought driving it. And even if you do absorb a blow, you move with it, which is a technique in the Korean martial art Hapkido. This technique makes the opponent overextend and lose balance, where they usually fall to the ground. In Chinese thought, this approach is explained by the concepts yin, which means the feminine and passive energy of the universe, and yang, which means the masculine and active energy of the universe. In Chinese thought, yin nourishes yang. This means that when we are intellig intelligently passive, or have poise in other words, we give birth to correct action minus aggression. This is a key point, correct action minus aggression. So we usually overextend in Hapkido or any martial arts and life in general when we are full of aggression and emotions. Essentially, if we are not receptive enough, we will be hard and rigid. And someone hard and rigid is easily overcome by someone who is soft and flexible because they have poise and are fully present in the moment. As Bruce Lee once said, be like water, my friend. This effortless cognitive style is similar to the movements of a graceful dancer. Intelligent spontaneity is not only the effect of a dancer being perfectly calibrated to the environment, but it is also the essential goal of martial arts or any skill for that matter. In a state of intelligent spontaneity, we approach life with a mind of no deliberation. An expert craftsman embodies this effortless state of mind. The craftsman integrates the two systems into mind-body holism, and so they are perfectly adapted to the world around them. But to cultivate expert skill and skill in life, we have to understand how a craftsman disengages from the cold system to allow the hot cognitive virtues of nature to spontaneously flower. The expert craftsman is a perfect example of how both systems function together to evoke intelligent spontaneity. Their mind absorbed in their craft is a metaphor for how we too can be absorbed fully in life through a chosen skill. A skilled craftsman's integration of mind and body back into original holism is the result of years of training their embodied cognition to be as natural as nature itself. The craftsman moves effortlessly through their skill and this is applied to life in general. When the two systems function naturally, it is totally normal to be perfectly calibrated to the environment. This integration of both systems means that the mind is embodied and the body is mindful. To make the two systems integrated and working together, we need to develop the ability to concentrate for extended periods of time, which will eventually evoke a deep level of focus that arises from the hot system. A skilled craftsman can evoke this ability spontaneously any time if it is needed, to the extent that it is as normal as chewing food for them. The way the process begins is through the long and arduous training 
which is required to call on a skill upon command. The process of learning a skill to this heightened degree is dependent on a strong cold system to begin with. A strong cold system is dedicated to the theory of a particular skill and the discipline required to make it embodied. We have all tried to get better at something which requires practice every day. Usually we don't want to use a lot of effort, but something inside us says, you know, stop being a weakling, suck it up and push forward. That inside dictator is of course the cold cognition. And it is a strong cold cognition if the message is taken on board to push forward. When a craftsman strengthens their cold cognition and becomes a dedicated student to whatever skill they're learning, they are ever so slowly downloading the subtle nuances and theoretical details of that skill into their hot cognition. As a result, the skill begins to unconsciously manifest. The hot system's ability to fine tune a particular skill continues when a strong cold cognition has an iron will to reach beyond the known limits. As this process continues, the craftsman invariably encounters an unexpected snag, which is that the cold system begins to inhibit flow states of consciousness. So once a skill has become ingrained in the hot system, the cold system is a hindrance because of its tendency to analyze and overthink. When a skill has become embodied, the primary way to get better is to continually perform that skill through constant repetition. But this cannot happen if the cold system is still functioning, meaning when it is essentially in the way. From a contemporary cognitive science perspective, this is what it actually means when we say we are in our own way, meaning the cold system is in the way of the hot system naturally expressing itself. If the cold system cannot be downregulated, it inhibits intelligent spontaneity. The effortlessness in a performance no matter what it is, is ruined when we begin to overthink about what we are doing. As a result, we regress back into mind-body dualism training. The natural flow of expert skill and peak performance result from embodied cognition, so mind-body holism. The problem in trying to attain intelligence spontaneity is we don't know how to temporarily shut down cold cognition. What you need to remember is that when we are fully engaged in what we are doing, cold cognition is naturally downregulated because parts of the brain are not activated when they are not necessary. And when intelligent spontaneity comes to life, cold cognition is not activated because it is not part of nature's spontaneous beauty. When the spontaneity of the hot system is expressed through a skill or otherwise, cold cognition is downregulated. When skill is ingrained in the hot system, we we access, more often than not, a deep level of focus with a sense of you doing something has evaporated. You have merged as one with the activity. There is no distinction between you and your skill. They are one. As a result, you are one with the terrain your skill has to navigate through. This experience is commonly referred to as being in the zone. The real reason you are in the zone is because your cold cognition has been downregulated to let the spontaneous nature of life come alive through you. Essentially, there is no person because the cold system has downregulated. Remember, the cold system is where we identify with ourselves as a person. Just this very small part of the brain in the prefrontal cortex, we are much more than that. So in the experience of intelligent spontaneity, we come in contact with a deeper level of existence beneath our personality within our hot system. This deeper level of existence is where the naturalness of life spontaneously arises. The spontaneity arising of itself is the Chinese concept of Zitran, meaning nature is fundamentally of itself and your skill can become as nature is if you discover that flow state within your chosen skill, which in turn trains you to extend those skills into everyday life. This is the end goal of intelligent spontaneity or flow and wu wei, because your skill is your second nature in the sense that it is as effortless as opening and closing your hand. Now you truly understand what flow is. So now it's up to you to enter that flow state 
so that you can bring your ingrained skill forth to inspire the world.